Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hello, everyone. I am very delighted to have Dan Shaw back on the show. This is part two of my wonderful, wonderful conversation with him. He's always investigating and exploring, researching, writing, and uh, it's always wonderful to talk to him. He's also an all-around nice guy. But on top of it, he has some really interesting things to share. If you haven't already done so, listen to part one of my conversation with him. It is really, really wonderful. He is talking today a little bit more about traumatic narcissism. He is the author of Traumatic Narcissism, Relational Systems of Subjugation, and Traumatic Narcissism and Recovery, which introduced traumatic narcissism theory to the field. He is also an honored recipient of the Margaret Singer Award from the International Cultic Studies Association for his work on coercive persuasion and undue influence. For more information on Dan and his work, visit DanielShawLCSW.com. Here's Dan with some new and really important information for you. Very excited to have Dan Shaw back with me today. After we finished our discussion that became an episode, there was more to talk about. There's always more to talk about, but there is a particular list of behaviors that Dan wants to be able to share with you today. And so today, Dan Shaw is going to run through these eight behaviors that individuals who think they may be in a relationship with a narcissist, who sometimes also a particular kind of narcissist, might want to look for. If you feel that you are being, as Dan says, coercively controlled, how do you determine that? What do you look for? And this list is good for people in these situations, as well as mental health professionals, people also, I think, who are the loved ones who are on the sidelines, who are noticing and want to be able to help their loved one determine, and they need to know how to decipher what's happening here and what qualities and traits and behaviors to be mindful of that all come together into a picture that we want to be really wary of. So, Dan, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, um, I had to write um, an introduction, a new introduction to a new edition of my first book, Traumatic Narcissism, Relational Systems of Subjugation. And in working on that, I started talking about behaviors of the traumatizing narcissist. And because since I wrote that book, I've been working with so many people either having left a cult or trapped in or trying to leave or having left a relationship with a person that I think of as a traumatizing narcissist. And there are different ways I have been defining who that person is. I think this list of eight behaviors might provide the most recognizable way or ways of um, being aware of this kind of coercive control that is typical of the traumatizing narcissist. So here's the thing. When you call somebody a narcissist or a traumatizing, malignant, pathological, NPD, whatever you want to call them, those are labels. They're useful, but they just tell you in a way generally, this is a bad person who's being bad to you. And I think it's important to be specific about what kind of badness are we looking at? How do we articulate, verbalize what that is? How do we identify it? So, um, yeah, these are consistent behaviors of this kind of narcissist that I've, I've been hearing about and thinking about for the last 30 years. All right, here's how I'll do it. Number one, I'll count them down. Number one, intimidating, belittling, humiliating, 
and seducing. Four words that are like the big four that you want to be aware of. So by leveraging whatever's attractive about him, his looks, and by the way, I'm using male pronouns. We could make them female at any gender. I'll use the male just to make it simple. By leveraging whatever's attractive about him, looks, charm, charisma, creativity, spirituality, intellect, money, prestige, the traumatizing narcissist masters the art of seduction. And then the controlling behaviors follow, intimidating, belittling, and humiliating with seductiveness used as intermittent reinforcement. So here's an example. There's a recent uh, film out, Priscilla. It dramatizes how Elvis Presley treated his child bride, Priscilla Wagner Beaulieu. And in this film, you see these random, unnerving ways that Elvis is absolutely terrifying her, intimidating and belittling, and then seducing right back. It's so well portrayed in the film. These contemptuous behaviors and the seductive ones, they contribute to a sense of constant threat. So when you're under the spell of a traumatizing narcissist and you become intensely dependent and terrified of offending him, you're always on eggshells. You're always hypervigilant. And, and, you know, he can become belligerent and punitive in the blink of an eye. And then the possibility of being banished becomes the victim's greatest fear. And the victim starts doing anything possible to appease and placate. And again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough that I've just seen many cases where a man is being treated this way by a woman, but it is more frequently the other way around. Mm -hmm. All right, number two, creating dissociation. Ooh. Coerced, disorganized attachment. Okay. Now, this is an important one. Now, over time, the traumatizing narcissist increases his use of the contemptuous behaviors, the belittling, the humiliating. And with his victim now captured, as in the tale of the slowly boiled frog, right? And he's inducing in the victim this dissociative trans like state. So you and I, I think, have both read Alexandra Stein's book, Terror, yeah. Love, and Brainwashing, mm -hmm. with this wonderful attachment research that she did on cult survivors uh, for her PhD, right? And so uh, she described how cult survivors experience a state of disorganized attachment. And what that means is it, it was um, part of the attachment theory research of Maine and Solomon. They showed that a developing child's instinct to run toward the parent for safety, when met by a frightening and frightened parent, creates in the child a paralysis, a dissociative kind of freeze. And um, it's too confusing. How can I reconcile that you are how I stay alive and safe in the world with you are terrifying me? But this is exactly how you feel in a relationship to a traumatizing narcissist. You have everything I want and need in the world. You've, you've let me know that I am the greatest person you've ever loved. And, and yet you are constantly angry at me and terrifying me. What do I do to survive this? I have to become dissociative. And this is where I start to lose contact with consensual reality, your friends, your, your family, they're all telling you, you're being abused. You shouldn't let him treat you that way. And your dissociation is saying, they're wrong. He, he loves me or she loves me. You know, so that dissociative state that the traumatizing narcissist is able to create is a very important thing to understand. A, a lot of times when people first come to us out of these relationships. It's like they're trying to come out of anesthesia, you know? It's like they are so, what happened? What happened to me? How could this be happening to me? 
that's the dissociation that they have become trapped in that they're trying to get out of. Wow. Number three, I call weaponized suffering. Mm. Okay, so I use that term to describe how victims are made to feel responsible for whatever pains or irritates or enrages the narcissist. Whatever makes the narcissist feel bad, it's your fault. He pounces like a hawk on any behavior that he perceives as critical or insulting or ungrateful or disrespectful or you know, if you sneezed, he pounces on it. Uh, over and over, the victim is accused of being the cause of all of his unhappiness or his anger, his pain, his illness. And I used this example from a movie that only people our age would have seen because everybody young has never looked at a black and white movie, apparently. But I think the movie Now Voyager has such a great example of this. Betty Davis stars in this film. And after having a nervous breakdown, she comes back to her horrible mother, her horrible traumatizing narcissist mother's house in Boston. And now, instead of being dowdy and frumpy, she's a beautiful, elegant woman. And the mother hates that. And the mother, at one point, they're having a little argument, and the mother says, take off that dress. Put on the one I gave you. And, and Betty Davis is very calm because she's gotten helped out and at the nervous breakdown place she went to. And she says, Mother, I'm not going to take off the dress. I happen to like it very much. And I'll see you at dinner. And she turns around to walk out. And her mother drops dead. So to me, that is the ultimate example of weaponized suffering. You are such a bad person that you actually killed me. Is like how you get to the right. end of the spectrum on weaponized mm -hmm. suffering. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but it, right. It, it, is, it, is, it is much more you know, lower down the spectrum constantly happening to a person who's in a relationship with a traumatizing narcissist. They're, they're always at fault for what's they're wrong. They're always at fault, right. And, and so this other piece that I talked to a lot of people about where they weren't allowed to emote, they weren't allowed to cry, they weren't allowed to be angry or anything, but really just crying. Um, that that was seen as somehow uh, weak or a manipulation. And so is that tied in here with the person who just doesn't want to have to have a mirror held up to what he or she did to someone else? And tears are this sort of mirror, like, look how you impacted me. So instead, it gets sort of diagnosed away as being a manipulation or being a weakness so that you stop doing it. I think that's a great point, because the narcissist is the needy, complaining, whiny one, but somehow arranges this so that you, the victim, feel that that's who you are, especially if you have any kind of a legitimate reaction to their abuse. So, I mean, I think that's a great point. Also, you know, there's another variation where you claim illness and disability that requires constant attention. You even threaten suicide if the victim doesn't stay there and take care of you. So that's another kind of weaponized suffering that you'll see. It, it looks less like belligerence, but it's it just as manipulative. So weaponized suffering, right? Okay, now the next one, I think I'm on four, right? Uh -huh. Darvo. Darvo. Uh -oh, yeah. Or uh, offending from the victim position, which is also known as gaslighting. Now, so in pop psychology, narcissists are described as gaslighting. It's from the film Gaslight, in which Charles Boyer, another black and white, is almost manages to convince Ingrid Bergman that she's insane, but he's doing it deliberately because he wants to get control of her inheritance. So in that story, Gaslight, it's a deliberate conscious strategy of repeatedly accusing and blaming the victim, and it's being used for criminal purposes. Now, by contrast, the traumatizing narcissist isn't, in my view, conscious and usually not all the way up to criminal, at least not by a legal definition. So rather, I think the traumatizing narcissist is delusionally committed to his belief 
in his innocence and his righteousness, right? So when we call what they're doing gaslighting, it's, you know, that's okay. Everybody uses that word. It works. It's fine. It's not exactly accurate, but I actually think Darvo is more accurate. So Darvo was an acronym that Jennifer Freed in her work on betrayal trauma came up with, and it stands for deny, attack, reverse victim and offender, right? So the trauma, so here's how that looks. The traumatizing narcissist is going to react to any protests or grievance that you bring, or maybe you start crying, like you were saying, and he will react by categorically a D, denying that he did anything wrong, and A, attacking you. And then he R, reverses reality by claiming that he is the victim, V, of your offense. Unwarranted, your, your unwarranted malicious attack, which he frames as a betrayal, and you are the offender. Okay, so he's always innocent and you're always guilty. And this was, and, and that's, that the other phrase I like was summed up by Pia Mel Melody. And she calls it offending from the victim position. So the traumatizing narcissist acts like the victim while they are abusing. That's a dead giveaway. But each of the behaviors so far, they almost always come together. In other words, you don't see just one and not the others. So the narcissist repeated accusations of betrayal and disrespect, whether it's in response to a complaint or just coming out of nowhere, it forces the victim to be focusing exclusively on what they have to do to appease him. And that forecloses the victim's ability to attend to what he feels or needs or wants. So it's another form of separating the victim from their own subjectivity, from their own internal reality, because they have to be continually preoccupied and frightened about the narcissist, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. Okay. Okay. You know, it's reminding me of, you know, the, um, the Scientology term that you brought it in, like somehow you invited. Yes. It, right. That it's because you're of at you. cause is you're what Renee was saying, right. Right, right? And what did you do? I I sometimes tell the story of a relationship I had been in years ago, where if my partner yelled at me, whatever, gave me a hard time, I need to I needed to apologize, right? And the reason was that I must have done something before that caused this outburst on their part. And so they're not responsible for it. I am. Yeah, yeah. Same thing in a cult. You know, the guru is uh, absolutely viciously berating you. This happened to me. And then, I, and then the surrogates would be sent to tell me, well, what did you understand about what Guru Mai was doing there? And then I would have to explain why Guru Mai's viciousness was actually for my own good. That went on for a while uh, before I left Sydney. Oh, my goodness yeah. gracious. That's intense. So, okay, the next one, I think now we're on, what, five or six? I forget. We're on and five. So the, the next one is isolation and going no contact. So these are, those are related. They're not exactly the same, but I wanted to talk about going no contact, which is big right now. Uh, with narcissistic abuse uh, advice because it, it, and it means cutting off all contact completely. And it's being advised a lot by people who are suggesting this is the only way you can protect yourself from the narcissist, right? What, what I've seen is I've often seen it turned around and used in a distorted way by abusers, similar to the way a group like Scientology or, the, or Jehovah's Witness will demand that followers will cut off all contact with anybody who criticizes the group. And if, if they don't cut off the contact, they'll be shunned. They'll be disfellowship. They'll be a suppressive person. So you are being told in a cult, you must have no contact with these people who are criticizing what you're doing. And 
Individuals who are traumatizing narcissists often do this as well. They isolate the victim. They convince the victim that every friend and family is an enemy to be discarded. And, you know, this is all the way that a traumatizing narcissist is always, on the one hand, acting like, I'm just doing this to help you. I don't need anything. When in fact, the traumatizing narcissist is the neediest person in the world and needs absolute and total 100% constant attention, adoration, obedience, and submission. And so the isolation strategy certainly plays into that. And when it's a one-on-one, it, uh, um, we sometimes call it predatory alienation. The, the, the victim is alienated from all those friends and family, right? And, you know, I've been approached, as I'm sure you have, by many, many parents or families who are desolate and absolutely heartbroken at a loved one just telling them, I never want to speak to you again, under the influence of a partner who has decided that, you know, that's how this is going to go. And the adult child who does that does not realize that all that the traumatizing narcissist is offering them is bondage. Ah, uh, right. Mm-hmm. And yet it's, it's, it's marketed or the PR of the narcissist is that this is for your safety, your protection, your liberation. But none of those things are what's being really offered. What's offered is bondage to the Incredible. narcissist. Right? Incredible. Right, right, exactly. Okay. And it, maybe it is good to cut off the, the contact with this abuser. You know, that could be a, a reasonable option, but it has to be one of all the options you're looking at. And, may, and, and certainly if you're a therapist, you have to be very careful about recommending that when it's possible that that could, in fact, backfire or be harmful to your client. And people who are, you know, just going with the online advice sometimes don't get the nuanced exploration of what makes sense in terms of boundaries. You know, if it's possible, I'll give an example on it. It's just very pragmatic, but you're the adult child of somebody with a lot of money and you're going to inherit a bundle and you've struggled all your life because you've been abused all your whole life. Right. And so do you want to go no contact and get written out of that will? Or is there a way to have boundaries, hang on to that relationship somehow, tolerate and manage the, everything, and not get written out of the will? Practically speaking, sometimes that's a better choice. And my point is, this is not a one-size-fits-all deal, and you really have to think carefully about doing that. Right, right. All right, I've got the next one. Uh, I think it's seven by now, right? Right, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Provoking jealousy, the traumatizing narcissist envy. So a traumatizing narcissist is always provoking jealousy in the one they're trying to control or the ones in a group. So if it's a one-on-one, like the husband's going to lavishly praise and ogle other women right in front of his wife, or a mother or father flamboyantly going to elevate one of the siblings and, you know, ignore the other. A boss will lavishly praise one employee in front of the others and give somebody a raise and ignore the other. You know, so this provoking jealousy punishes the victim for not being sufficiently adoring. And then it incentivizes the victim to be willing to submit more deeply. What you see, what you see is that you weren't good enough to get the, the narcissist's elevation. And so you have to try harder. You have to submit more deeply, adore more completely. And then maybe they'll elevate you. And maybe the other one will get put down. And and narcissists are always elevating and devaluing, you know, always. So the other thing about that, though, is I think that, that provoking jealousy in others kind of distracts the narcissist from how profoundly envious they are, which they don't want to ever acknowledge to themselves, right? They, the narcissist wants to believe that he has no equal, you know, that he's the greatest. 
And I and not like Muhammad Ali or Cash, you know, who was funny about I'm the greatest. More like Donald Trump, I am the greatest, who is clearly the most incompetent, right? But he wants to believe he is, in fact, the greatest. But he knows that other people are smarter, richer, more accomplished, more talent, more beauty. He knows he's not. So, you know, provoking everybody else's envy and jealousy helps distract him from his own envy is, uh, you know. And it, let's, let's use the example of Keith Raniere, right? The guy on The Vow about Nexium, that, that um, kind of groundbreaking documentary that I think almost more than anyone previously really showed how a traumatizing narcissist behaves, right? So he's serving a life sentence for pedophilia and sex trafficking and other felonies. He had full access to the Seagram heiress, uh, Claire Bronfman, to her fortune, which was huge. So he was able, before the crimes were brought to light, he was able to get an, he was able to buy an audience with the Dalai Lama. That was filmed by Mark Vicente, who became a whistleblower. So I'm watching that doc, that film of him, of Raniere with the Dalai Lama in the van. And it looks to me like Raniere is more or less trying to indicate to the Dalai Lama that you and me, we're on the same footing. You and, you and me, we're, we're the same. We're equals, right? And, you know, he's even stretching out his hand to try to hold the Dalai Lama's hand. And you can see the Dalai Lama is like, oh, this guy's full of shit. But, you know, trying to be polite. And actually, I was certain that Raniere believed that he was superior to the Dalai Lama watching that clip, right? So I actually um, got in touch with Mark Vicente and I asked him about it. He was the cameraman that filmed it and later the whistleblower, right? And what he said was that Raniere told him that Rainier felt the Dalai Lama needed his help. And, um, <laughs> right, so Rainier, the sadistic pedophile who's in jail for life for, you know, uh, sex trafficking, et cetera, was so envious, and I would, I would say so contemptuous of the Dalai Lama that he actually thought he could make himself recognized as the Dalai Lama's equal or superior, right? And I like to say that Rainier didn't become terminally paralyzed while staring at his reflection in a pool of water, uh -huh. like Narcissus. Uh -huh. But he is spending the rest of his life in jail, which is more or less the same mm -hmm. same fate as Narcissus, mm -hmm. right? And I wonder also, you know, when people talk about coming out of a cultic system or just, you know, kind of being raised maybe by a parent who has these sorts of traits, it feels to me like they got introduced to this notion that in the world, you need to be above so you're not below, that people don't see eye to eye. They, you aren't one of many. And the threat of being beneath, forgotten about, less whatever, fill in the blank, adjective, can drive you to maintain that place above all others. And then there is, I think, this abject loneliness. But I wonder if this kind of personality doesn't feel that because they don't need the connection as much as they need the adoration or the fear. Like people will say, like, don't, you know, it's lonely at the top. Well, you know, okay, so, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know if I need people. I just wonder about the psyche of the person who just always needs to be be elevated or rem, be reminded of how high and mighty they are. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I have a point. My That's going to be my eighth point. I'm going to address exactly what you're talking about there. And I'm going to tell you what my, how, I'm, how I've been thinking about it, right? So I have one more point before we get to that one. I'll just, and the, this is, I guess, seven then. What I, what I would call a demand for perfection and purity. So over time, if you're under the control of the traumatizing narcissist, it means that you're always being made to feel like you're not good enough and you're not giving enough and you're not doing enough. And 
it applies to everything you say and do, how you look, what you weigh, all your choices. None of it is the right thing or enough. Or And des- you get desperate to please the traumatizing narcissist. And you're always fearful of being shamed and reproached. And you learn to demand perfection of yourself. And you'll work yourself to exhaustion. You'll starve yourself. You'll take on shame and self-loathing all in this effort to improve yourself so that they won't tell you that you're not enough. And if you're under the control of a traumatizing narcissist who claims to be enlightened or have spiritual wisdom, and we know how many people burst onto the internet during COVID who claimed that. It was like a a mushroom cloud of uh, charlatans, basically. Um, Then the demand for perfection becomes a demand for absolute purity. So, for example, the wrinkle on your forehead shows that you have bad thoughts and you need to isolate yourself and meditate and fast and pray until you can stop bringing others down with your bad vibrations. So that's the spiritual version of it's not good enough. You have to purify yourself. And if it sounds silly, what I just said, I've heard it repeated a gazillion times. It's it's like a standard thing in these kinds of spiritual groups led by narcissists. The narcissist's demand for perfection and purity means that the victim can never stop trying harder and giving more. And if they have any success with pleasing the narcissist, it's going to be temporary because shaming and punishment follow pretty quickly, almost always, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, the last one, I'm going to call it delusional contagion. And we're talking about the delusion of omnipotence. And that's, I was talking to you more about that in the uh, episode, right? That's, I was getting into that there a little more. So I'll, I'll just re- reference it here again. So the traumatizing narcissist has to have a delusion of omnipotence. They have to keep themselves fully believing that they are the superior entitled person they, they want to be, that they want to be seen as. And delusions, I, it is a delusion. And in my opinion, and delusions are inherently unstable. Delusions are like a dam. I may have talked about this in the episode with leaps that constantly need to be plugged. And that's why gaining control of and exploiting the resources of others is so important to the traumatizing narcissist. He has to repeatedly prove himself to be all powerful to keep his delusion from crumbling. So all the behaviors I've described, this whole list, they all arise from this need to be continually reinforcing their delusion of omnipotence. And those behaviors are the ways that he is plugging the holes in the dam that are holding back. So what's behind the dam that's about to burst? Well, for a narcissist, it's Shame, fear, impotence, smallness, weakness. It's everything that he doesn't want to believe is true about himself. And uh, nevertheless, it's all back there. It's all behind that delusion. And if that delusion breaks open, that flood comes out and he goes insane. This is why you see cult leaders go insane. Shoko Asahara, Jim Jones, David Koresh, etc. Berg, all these people, they go insane when the delusion cannot be held because they are exposed. They are exposed and humiliated, and they go insane. So I think this is the most important thing to understand. The the behavior of the traumatizing narcissist is what he does to try to maintain his delusion of omnipotence. And it's a very fragile delusion. And the only way he can make it look strong is if he can dominate and control and subjugate. And when he succeeds in doing that, 
temporarily, he shored up that dam, but then he's got to keep doing it again and again and again. So there is, this is a delusional kind of mental illness in this kind of narcissist that most people find it hard to wrap their head around because he looks, first of all, you're with this kind of person long enough and everything they're doing gets normalized. And you start to think, well, this is this is normal. People have their problems and issues. And and certainly his claim that he's totally normal and it's your left crazy. It's just, you know, little by little you buy into it. So it's very hard to um, you know, people are driven crazy. They believe their partner is crazy. They're trying to get out of the relationship. But when you try to explain that your partner has a delusion. They're like, well, if I, yeah, but, you know, sometimes he was nice. Or they're like, um, well, I kept thinking that if I could find the right words, he would, he would see what he was doing and it would make sense. And, and I would be able to convince him, you know. No, there are impossible people. A traumatizing narcissist is an impossible person with whom it is impossible to negotiate your own sanity, your own uh, validity. And that's what's hard for people to realize when they try to get out of these things. This person is impossible. You can't uh, change them. They won't change. And uh, a lot of people stay for a long time because uh, they keep thinking they can change them. Right, right. Yeah, if they just do it perfectly, if they're nice enough, if they're more self-sacrificial, Right. If they do everything they're supposed to. And I think, yeah, you can exhaust yourself and to no avail because it's not about that. Yeah. When people are asked, well, why did you stay? I mean, one of those reasons is that it's all about pleasing and getting it right. And especially if the, and for a lot of other reasons, but especially if the rules change. You have to remaster this new system with the shaking foundation, like the tectonic plates under you that just keep moving. And that's that's where the disorganized attachment comes in because, because you've become dependent, but you're also being terrified. You dissociate. And everybody can see that there's no point in trying to placate this narcissist and you're driving yourself crazy, but you don't see it because you have become dissociative. That's how I think about this. And so that, you know, you freeze when he starts berating you, and then you try to, like, repair the damage, like, and then you end up apologizing. Um, and you keep thinking, once that is over, it's not going to keep happening. You dissociate that it's going to happen like any minute, any time. There's no, there's no telling when, and it's just going to happen randomly. And, um, you know, but you dissociate. Okay, now we fix it. Now we love each other. Now it's okay. So all of these behaviors induce further dissociation and further submission in the victim. And it's what makes the narcissist trap so powerful. Mm, right. And my effort, yours as well, in your work, not just in your clinical work, but in your educational work, you know, is to like help people get it so that they are not imprisoned and subjugated in these uh, situations. And so thank you so much for this. This is incredible. I feel like you just handed us a gift with a bow on it. I wonder uh, about just for people to get a sense of what it feels like to be in your body, to be in your psyche when you're faced with this. Yes, there's the dissociation. And does it also come with confusion or futility or... Right. Roller coaster. Like, what else have you found that people feel in this? All of that, Rachel, exactly. Um, confusion. Sometimes people feel like I'm on a mission. And I know that so and so really means well and is really a good person. And I'm just going to fix them. Or people feel like, uh, 
I'm strong. I don't need, you know, I don't, I can handle this. I don't need somebody to coddle me. You know, people have problems. I can handle this. So aside from feeling like you're falling to pieces and you're going out of your mind and you want to uh, just stay in bed and you don't know how to talk anymore, that's one way it can go, uh, which is, you know, I ended up there at the end of my time in the ashram. I lost my voice. I lost the ability to speak or put a sentence together uh, for a while anyway. You know, or another way to go is to have this, you know, develop, join this delusion and like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm never going to give up. I'm committed. I can handle it. I'm strong. But I think for most people, it's exhausting, no matter which way they go with it, whether they're holding it together better or worse, they're exhausted. They are unable to take care of their own desires and needs, unable to attend to their thoughts and feelings. Often they become unable to really uh, notice and care for their children because the narcissist wants them, it actually resents attention they pay to their children and only wants attention paid to him or her. So in the end, you are drained. And I've often compared this, and I think others have as well, to Dracula, you know, Dracula, in order to roam about at night and enjoy himself the way he likes to do, to get out of that coffin, he's going to have to find fresh blood every night. You know, and if he can't find it, he doesn't, you know, it's going to, it's not, it's going to be bad. He's not going to be able to keep going. And the narcissist is like that. And if you stop supplying what they need, they're going to find a way to get somebody else to start supplying it ASAP. The sheets are, uh, will still be warm before they have somebody else there filling your role. You, if you're lost, you, you know, I'm now with the person who's actually 10 years younger than you. You know, this is the classic. And um, they are, that's who they are. They cannot live without being fed in that way by people who are willing to submit and subjugate themselves. And I say willing to, but that's not accurate. Who can be manipulated and coercively controlled to subjugate mm -hmm. and submit. Right. That's what's accurate. Right. Okay. So I, I have a question that I get asked a lot. Um, so here is the question, which is, is maybe answerable, maybe not. Did they ever mean it? Did they ever mean that they loved me? Did they ever want to do good things for me? And, and did they ever have pure intentions? Um, did they ever have good advice for me? Or was it all that, the, that they were angling to use that information as a way to control me? Can this person be both? You know, um, what are your thoughts? That's the million dollar question. It is the one everyone always is kind of going insane trying to figure out. I have an answer for that. But having an answer for somebody trying to sort this out doesn't mean that they're like, oh, okay, I get it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm free now. Right, right. So right. having the right. answer is just the beginning of working your way out of out of the situation. It's just the beginning. And the and the answer is complicated because the answer is yes, kind of, sort of, sometimes. What I what I often say is that this person actually would like to be able to love. They would like to be like a normal person who can love and be loved. So you may see at some point that they are loving. It doesn't just feel manipulative and it isn't just manipulative. But to, to have exposed even for an hour, a minute, that kind of vulnerability is what's going to lead the narcissist to immediately go back to all of their defenses and all of their delusions about themselves, all the ways in which they're threatened uh, by the possibility of anybody seeing them as vulnerable, weak, dependent, 
any of those things. You know, their only hope of survival is to believe themselves to be completely shameless and completely independent and um, not needing anything. All they all they want to do is give. So you see, you feel and see something that feels so right, so big, so beautiful. For me, it was with the guru, it was a mystical experience of ecstatic, you know, union with everyone and everything. And if and nothing felt more real, it was in my body. It wasn't, I didn't imagine, you know, it couldn't have felt more real. And it's what persuaded me to become a follower for the next 13 years. What I had to find out was that the person with whom I had that experience was also a a pedophile and a sadistic criminal abuser. And I had that experience. So trying to help somebody be able to wrap their head around the idea that, guess what? Both of those things are true. That's a lot of healing. That's a lot of of grief and healing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to talk to you again and hear these wonderful ideas uh, and your and your wonderful concepts and and terminology which is really helpful to have and to use and I can't wait for people to to see these things in print and be able to use them as a guide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me uh, share this with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. One more thing before you go. Thank you to Dan for our conversation today. It is so good to be continuously talking to people in my field who are uncovering more and more information, but also not just uncovering, but trying to put the puzzle together trying to understand what this image of this person who does these sorts of things without a second thought kind of looks like, how we can tell, how we can tell who this kind of person is, sometimes in order to do some prevention for ourselves so that we don't get caught up, we can develop this antenna that we might need to notice this kind of person. But what makes it very difficult, as Dan talks about, is that you don't just have someone who has these terrible traits. You don't have someone who just walks up to someone and is in their face as a bully, someone who just wants to be intimidating and belittling, someone who enjoys humiliating people like the, you know, playground bully kind of, I, I, sort of that vision. It is someone who is so slick, who has a way of charming people, who has a charisma, and they also have a piece of them that is really seductive. So I want to talk about two things having to do with this. One is that when someone is seductive, it could be that they're seductive from the start. Or it could be that, as I've heard from a lot of people, you didn't really find them wonderful or charming to begin with, but found yourself getting drawn in to their persona over time because mm, they showed something about themselves to be mm, truly unique or mm, because they came across like people who, mm, you know, they, you felt kind of specially chosen to spend time with them. You got charmed by how they chose you. You might have started to feel like the things that you didn't like about them to begin with were suddenly falling away. I mean, I've heard from a number of people who said that they became enamored with someone after at first really not liking them at all, not trusting them at all, sometimes even crossing over to the other side of the street so as not to deal with them. But there was something about them that just started to draw you in. 
And you want to notice that because sometimes that happens through genuine love. Sometimes that happens when you really, over time, start to fall in love and you don't notice mm, certain looks anymore that you might not have liked so much from the beginning or certain traits that you realize that you're able to ignore more and more. But if you're noticing that you're really starting to ignore some things you shouldn't because this person has gotten you to ignore things you shouldn't, has gotten you to try to not notice what you don't trust about them anymore, to not pay attention to those things, to not give them credibility, to not trust your own vision of these parts of them, to make you feel like you're being overly critical about those things or that you're wrong to assume them from the beginning. And now that those parts have been discarded, you now can find yourself emotionally making way for feeling attached or feeling loved, feeling enamored. Mm, You want to see the manipulation in that if you can. Why am I not feeling those things anymore? Is that because the person has proven to me that they really are worthy of my love? Or have they just made me feel that I'm wrong for having felt those things before or having noticed those things before? Find out where your feelings of being enamored and charmed by them come from and where your sudden lack of criticism is coming from. But the other piece that exists here is that if someone is charming, if someone is seductive, if someone is able to kind of have this kind of charisma where people might not notice the negative parts of them, then they know how to be very polished in public. But behind the scenes, behind closed doors, they're going to be very, very different. And that leads to a great amount of frustration and atrophy. The frustration is that people might not believe you if you come forward and say, this person did the following things to me, or this person is not who you think he or she really is. You only see the charming part of them. The atrophy comes in when you try to get people's attention, warn them that this person is this sort of two-faced person or a chameleon in this way. And no one is buying it. No one is going for it. And sometimes also, in the meantime, while they have been controlling you and manipulating you, they have been slowly etching away at your good reputation with others. So they have already started telling people that... They love you even though you're difficult to be with, or they love being with you even though sometimes you make up stories. You know, they're sort of trying to make it feel like they tolerate you, they put up with you, you should feel lucky to be with them, because after all, they could be with anyone, of course, with their charm and seductiveness. But they've chosen to be with you, so... That's been kind of a burden on them. So then when you go to your family and friends and say, I'm having a really hard time in this relationship, the person who you're with might have already gotten to them and said, listen, she doesn't always tell the truth or she's really the difficult one, but she turns things around and makes it seem like she's the victim. And so you can then feel like, what's the point? He's gotten to people before I have. He's changed their mind. He's made it seem like I don't have a leg to stand on. I don't have anything to say here that people are going to believe. Why should I even bother to leave? If you feel that this relationship is not safe for you, if you feel like you are slowly crumbling, slowly dying within it, you do need to leave. And that sometimes means going to a fresh group of people to support you who he or she didn't get to first. It might also mean, if you don't have others, to go to those same people who he got to first and say, listen, this is what people who are controlling other people do. They try to get to people first and defame them. Have you ever known me to be someone who lied? 
Have you ever known me to be someone who exaggerated to this degree? Have you ever known me to be someone so difficult in a relationship? Well, if not, then think about that. Think about why he needed for you to believe that. Think about why he wanted to disarm me so that I didn't have the ability to get support from you and I didn't have the ability to be believed by you. It's a tangled mess, but I hope it never causes you to feel like you can't put one foot in front of the other and find a way out. And that's why it's very good to consult with people who have helped others out of these situations, to go to talk to a therapist who can help you, a supportive friend, a community who can help you navigate this maze of different steps. Thank you again to Dan Shaw for coming on to talk about this and for all the research that you're doing and that you are giving us the treat of sharing it with us. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrination show at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.